Remember those days as a little kid, dreaming up your perfect spaceship design? Well, Starfield's shipbuilding system looks pretty sweet, and with the right components, you just might be able to bring that dream to life. And worst case scenario, the mods will make it so you can fly, uh, whatever you want through space. Welcome back to entry 0.4 of the Starfield Handbook Mumblers. This continuation of our space entry will dig deep into the complex shipbuilding and customization options we have at our disposal in the game, along with who can crew our crafts, and finally look into space travel and the faster than light tech we rely on for interstellar travel. If you're new to the channel, it's great to have you here, and to those returning, you guys are the best. Thank you for all your support. Strap yourself in for a knowledge-packed adventure of no bullshit Starfield content. We've got a lot to cover. The grounded in reality NASA punk style of ships in Starfield gives us a futuristic yet functional design that really strikes me as something we would see in our real world a few hundred years down the road from now. I will admit I would have liked to see some more super sleek aero and astro dynamically optimized ships that have insane top speeds for some space racing, but I think we'll have to save that pipe dream for the modders to take care of. For now we'll have to settle for the HMS Platypus, Optimus Prime, and the Dumpster Fire. When it comes to assembling your ship and building out a fleet of spacecraft, you have a few options to choose from. You can either buy a new ship with pre-installed components and work from there, or you can head out to space, board an enemy vessel, and take it for yourself. The latter will require you to register the ship in order to upgrade it, which Todd confirmed will require credits to do. It's not explicitly clear whether you can sell a ship without registering it, and whether components from captured vessels can also be sold individually, or attached to other ships you prefer to run. Once you get into the upgrading of your ship itself, you can either simply upgrade individual components as they're laid out on the baseline models of your ships, or you can move components around to create a more personalized design. This feature will give us pretty well limitless permutations of ship outcomes, but be warned it's said to come with a hefty price tag to dabble in this type of building. Not only can we change the shape of the ships, but we can also customize our ship's paint job. While this example shows colors being applied across the board, we've seen examples like the Optimus Prime ship where you can color on a per component basis. You seem to be able to choose a base color with two accents and can modify the hue, saturation, and brightness as well. There's a lot that quickly flies by in the direct and 2022 shipbuilder footage, so I'm going to break down a bunch of stills to help you better understand the system. There's also something very interesting with regards to ship prices that I've connected the dots on, and that's a great place to start. If you pay attention to the value of each ship, you'll notice a giant variance in ship value. The only time a ship value is actually high is if it's a ship you're looking to purchase from a vendor. Despite the stats looking fairly similar, we see two Class C ships worth 39k credits, while the unpurchased one is 656k. So it looks like buying out of the box ships can already rack up a pretty hefty tab, but it'll probably save you some tinkering time. Alternatively, you will be paying a lot to manually install individual components. What seems like it could actually end up being our most favorable option is to indeed just steal someone else's ship and register it, assuming that the register cost is that lower value number or something similarly cheap. You'll also notice that there's an option for making a ship your home ship. I'm guessing that's just going to be the ship that we actively fly out of the spaceport with. Taking a closer look at the ship overview, we have a pretty standard summary of our ship's general capabilities. Starting from the top, we have our fuel amount, which will dictate the maximum distance we can travel on a full tank using our grav drive, but it's a little more complicated than that, and I'll explain that when we get into jumps specifically. Next is hull, which we know is max HP, and of course cargo capacity, which we see obviously quite low on the smaller ship, and the number getting into the thousands on those larger freighters. For context, we only see carrying capacity on your player around the 300 to 400 range, so a freighter type ship will let you carry a healthy amount back to a vendor to rack up some credits. I'm not 100% sure what shield capacity means, but it could be the indicator for hidden cargo for smuggling contraband, or maybe if you die in space a certain amount is preserved. Next up is reactor class, which if you remember from last entry, seems to roughly correlate to ship size, but we're still not exactly sure what the thresholds are between A, B, and C. Then we've got the crew number, which is presumably the total number you can have on your ship, while it could also mean the number of crew you need to operate your ship at 100% efficiency, but I guess it's the former being realistic. Grav jump distance is very important as there are certain power breakpoints that will dramatically cut the number of jumps required to get from one system to another, and some that would just be flat out impossible to reach without a strong enough grav drive. We'll look at some more specific examples during the space travel section. The key point here is that the combination of fuel capacity and max grav jump distance will be the two factors that limit deep space exploration in the game. Last couple things on this overview include shield, which is pretty self-explanatory, then we've got our respective weapon type readouts, and then finally, total mass of your ship, which I'm thinking could play a role in our fuel consumption if certain thresholds are hit. A final note that I found very interesting was the fact that the final Class C ship example shows a reactor value of 40, 
I'll be the first to admit that I was wrong in part one and my most recent community quiz that 38 was the cap, which we inferred from this example and a manual counting of the bars on the reactor meter. This could just be a mock-up example that happens to say 40 and it's not true, but honestly I'm all for being wrong and being surprised by even higher numbers than the 38 we see from the visual meters. I'll definitely be checking this as soon as I have a chance to play the game. Now let's take a look at each of the respective ship components we'll be able to customize. We've got 13 different things to cover that will make up our perfect spacecraft. In no particular order, let's start with cockpits as we actually get a good look at many of them in the game. As a disclaimer, any of the stills that you see featuring this lighter blue blueprint looking floor is from the 2022 gameplay, and I suggest taking in information from these with some big grains of salt as there are frequent cases of generic filler numbers being used that are likely not representative of the final game. They do serve as decent reference points for what stats are likely to be featured in respective components, however. The cockpit is where you'll be controlling your ship from, where you can view your flight path, and it's also a place your crew can be situated. Every cockpit comes with a small amount of cargo space, some hull contribution, listed as health in the 2022 images, and finally a statement on how many crew members can take a seat there. I don't believe this is a modifier of max crew and I'm very confident that most of that will be reserved for HAB components. It is possible that this number will impact how many crew members can provide an actual contribution to your ship while in flight or combat. There's also this Phobos cockpit that has a starship design requirement, so you'll need some skill point investment to install this bad boy and other components of your ships that have similar requirements. But in return, you'll get a nice cargo bonus from this one. We also have a look at Jamie the Sandwich Lady's HMS Platypus in the builder, and you'll notice that we can also install bridges as an alternative to conventional cockpits. Anyone looking to sport a larger ship for more crewmates will definitely want to pick one of these up, and it also comes with a significantly larger cargo bonus. I think this is honestly an incredibly efficient purchase just for cargo alone, given that the mass contribution is only 17, when even on the smallest ships we've seen is barely a 5% mass increase, and as low as under 2% on larger ships, while that cargo increase could range from a 10 to 100% increase. Always pay top dollar for cock pits. Another thing to note here is the whole indicator situation at the bottom right. There are three statuses we can observe, the first being nominal, which implies everything's fine, then warning, which is actually very unclear and we don't have enough examples to confirm whether you can lock your ship in or not in this state, and then finally there's error. This occurs when your ship is either fully missing a critical component to operation such as a grab drive, or you have spare parts disconnected from the ship. Next up is grav drives, which we actually only have one proper still of. It's interesting that this grav drive also has a class rating on it, and I wonder if you must pair reactors and grav drives of the same class together. The grav drive number is how many points out of 12 you can allocate to it from your reactor power at the top, while jump thrust is the jump range in light years. Grav drive health is likely the explicit health it has if an enemy target locks onto that specific component. It's also definitely a lot heavier than the cockpits were, given that it's got 33 mass on what seems to be a pretty low tier grav drive. Dockers are just what we use to initiate boarding with vessels and star stations. I don't really see there being much of a difference between these stat wise, but aesthetically sure. Here's our only look at reactors and it's from 2022, so again this could be quite different on release. On the right we have a pretty long list of reactors, but the numbers are completely sketch. It's at least nice to see a few things to choose from at a single vendor of varying power levels though. As for stats, we've covered class before, along with power generated, but we haven't seen repair rate before. It's not clear if that repair rate applies to our hull or just our reactor health though. We've got general hull contribution, and then finally there's a crew rating tied to this. I guess I can see an angle for how this boosts that, since it's providing more power that could potentially support a higher crew count. Then we've got cargo holds, which we can see are quite a bit heavier for how much they can store compared to cockpits, but they're extremely cheap and they're just generic storage containers, so it's a fair trade-off. This will obviously be essential for anyone doing large supply runs, shuttling resources to main trading hubs. Landing bays look to be irrelevant stat-wise, but I'm sure we'll have some options to match to your ship aesthetics at least. And then we have engines, which have massive implications on your ship performance. We only have one still from 2022 in the direct, and a lot changed, so I'm going to ignore the 2022 one, but feel free to flip between them if you want to see what changed. With our updated info, we again see a class tied to the engines, making me think there's some sort of pairing we are going to have to do between the class-based components. Max power on this example is 3, and that is a per component additive stat. We've got two engines that look identical here, so we can see 6 in the power allocation at the top. So maybe if you stacked 4 of them together, you'd have to allocate 12 engine power to max out. I'm wondering if this will let us stack reactors as well for even greater power to allocate. We have some interesting numbers on engine and maneuvering thrust, but I don't have any context of whether what we're looking at is good or not. Engine health for if you're targeted specifically, a tiny bit of hull contribution, and interestingly, a fraction amount of crew capacity. Again, this is weird because is it boosting your total crew potential? Because that would be strange for an engine to impact that. 
or is it upping the minimum crew you need to operate your ship? It's still probably the former though, considering nothing has ever explicitly called out crew requirements that we've seen yet. A final comment here is that engines are heavy by many multiples over any of the other components we've looked at so far. Keep in mind that this is a class C engine, so those components have typically been larger on average, but still, they're giant. Mass is kind of weird for shipbuilding in this game, but I could also stuff hundreds of cheese wheels into my pants in Skyrim, and I can eat one of 28 sharks out of my backpack in a single munch in RuneScape, so I guess fair play. Ah, fuel tanks. Finally, we see one of the confirmed uses of Helium-3 in a description stating that grav drives rely on Helium-3 as a fuel source. For any fuel tank that you're installing, it seems like you get a modest contribution to your hull, and of course some fuel to keep your grav drive happy. You'll see most ships have multiple fuel tanks, and they're quite light in terms of mass. I'm curious how many we'll be able to stack onto a single ship, but it'll likely be limited by the design of the ship itself more than anything. For landers, we have a few different options to look at, and some have up to Starship Design Level 2 as a requirement, but they're all functionally the same. It's just a purely cosmetic difference between models from what we can see, aside from negligible mass and health stats. Now we get a good look at some of the HAB options. The first two we see seem generic and may just be hallway filler HABs, but everything after that is pretty neat. Almost all of these have different internal variants we can choose from, which is great for anyone looking for more control over their ship interiors. First, we've got a control station, which can hold up to four crew members, which I don't believe is a direct contribution to crew, but rather how many crew can do stuff in that HAB. I say this because the next HABs we look at instead say passion passenger slots passenger passenger slots passenger god damn it passenger slots which makes way more sense as a crew count modifier we see this on a hab called all-in-one berth and on ships and trains a berth commonly refers to beds typically stacked bunks. This feels like a much better match than any of the other options. The only other angle I can look at this counter for is if you needed special passenger slots on your ship for quests that move people to other systems or planets. It's also a little strange that the armories have passenger slot counts, but perhaps they're 50-50 split, or maybe it's for the people who like to sleep next to their weapons. We've got a captain's quarter, which could be fun for customizing, a computer core station, not sure if that will have any special functions like research and crafting, and then the control control station which might be for grabbing new missions from space or conducting more advanced scans from your ship. Just thoughts. One of the last things on the list is cowling which is pretty much purely cosmetic and it's what you're going to be using to help really define that look and feel of your spacecraft. The mass contribution is quite low so you shouldn't need to worry too much about adding what you want to make things look just right. I won't bother going over weapons because we covered that in part one. I will bring up the example of how we saw 16 times cost increases between power tiers though, and it's pretty clear that we're seeing dramatic multiples of cost increase on other ship components too. We haven't even seen rank 3 and 4 parts yet, and if they're even 2x of each previous tier, we're probably looking at millions of credits to outfit a fully decked out ship, which is why I think we get such strong emphasis from Todd on how this is truly a deep endgame system. I also want to point out that we have zero confirmed stills of shield generator stat displays, so it'll be interesting to see on launch what kind of contribution they have to your hull, as well as overall mass, on top of their shielding power. I'm expecting them to have various replenishment rates as well. I know that was a lot to digest, but I think it gives us a pretty clear picture of what to expect on release from shipbuilding. If there's anything I'm taking away from this, it's that I'm going to be stealing a lot of ships, especially if I can salvage components off them. I'm trying something new this time by not using any of the audio from interviews or narration from the Direct or 2022 footage, and I'm instead providing only my summary of them within my analysis. Let me know if you prefer this flow to the style of previous entries. I want to continuously improve your viewing experience, so your feedback means a lot, especially the criticism. Alright, let's talk a little bit about ship internals now. We briefly touched on it with HAB components, but we haven't taken a proper look inside. While it's not clear what the limitations are on internal ship decorating, we do know that there are specific HAB features like armories where you can display weapons, and that you can place simple items like sandwiches as you please. We'll see if this applies to larger furnishings, but most of the b-roll we've seen inside ships hasn't been particularly promising on that front. It'd be a bit of a bummer if we end up constrained to the rotation of layouts they give when we select HABs, even though it kind of makes sense since spacecraft fixtures are more important to have locked down than in our stationary outposts. Also the fact that we're likely to have many ships may diminish the necessity to be as creative with our ship internals until later in the game when we pin down our endgame spacecraft and stop swapping. I'm also very curious how gravity in ships is going to work with regards to our placed generic items, like will a pile of 300 sandwiches just start floating all over the place if our grav simulator just conks out randomly? Here we get a good look at a crafting and research station, which is definitely convenient to queue up new projects in between traveling to new locations. Then we have what looks like it could be a bridge as we have a few crew seating areas, a navigation table, and what looks like a few storage bins, which fits given that we saw a bridge with a much larger cargo capacity in the shipbuilder. 
which begs the question of how exactly does storage function on your ship? Can you do a giant dump outside of your ship and number goes up? What about when you're inside your ship? Does accessing any storage container give master access to everything? Or is your 300 bridge storage separate from accessing your cargo bin storage? I personally liked having storage containers have different purposes in Skyrim where my vault held all my gems and precious metal bars, so I'll be a little disappointed if it's all just one big mishmash. Granted, we didn't have the complication of being in space on one of what could be many different spacecraft, so I'll give this a pass if it's not quite as sophisticated, because it could quickly become a pain in the ass clearing out multiple bins on your ship before you plan to sell it. Definitely keep that in mind in case the game does ignore your stored cargo when you sell a ship. I like this living quarter still because the ship feels lived in. You've got those marks of wear at the bottom of the bed on the vents, and the pictures have a nice personal touch. If this isn't just a set of display b-roll, then that's definitely cool, and I hope that there's a good deal of variety of these small details so that things don't start to feel samey too quickly. Also, that rolly cart is going to go flying if somebody doesn't stow it away before takeoff. A nice look at a cargo hold here. I'd wager we must be able to do a larger access of all our stored cargo from any of these on our ship. A mess hall with nothing remarkable about it. This control room is interesting because we get a look at what seems to be a vault door, but it could just be a more reinforced airlock. It seems to have some cargo in it though, so perhaps you can store more valuable items in there. I doubt this is where our hidden cargo would be stored, as that door is kind of a big red flag to any inspection crew that says, look in here. We have another look at how stowage is incorporated into the design of each element of the ship here, with the back of the seat having a small area for holding items. I hope we can interact even with these little guys. Again, the detail here is great with the bins lining the entryway, efficiently utilizing the space within the craft, and doing service to the realism side of the NASA punk theme. I do love looking at the living quarters examples, but I can't help but laugh when I see all the shit that would just go flying everywhere in a dogfight unless they have some good stow before combat practices in place. There are some neat little goodies on the walls and some of the b-roll we're flipping through, but I'm sure most of you have seen it 10 times over elsewhere at this point, so I'll spare you from microscoping on every detail here. I will say that this bed looks like it could definitely be Barrett's though, given the pictures of Vosco and the drawings of the artifacts on the wall. Nice little kitchen setup with a recipe to the coveted sandwich is a good indication we'll be able to whip up some trilobites and other food on board. Then we have a few images featuring the docking bridge access lift in orange. We actually see this early on in the direct when we board the ship after being greeted by Vosco. Speaking of lifts, we haven't talked about the potential for multi-level ships that we can own, but this seems very likely as the Class C Voyager 3 we saw in shipbuilding looks like it might even have three levels to it. Nothing special here, just a succulent that looks like it would clock Sarah Morgan in the head during any evasive maneuvers. Then we've got another look at the navigation console where we'll be able to access our star map yeah. and chart a course to our next destinations. But this slide has a neat little safe at the bottom that might just be our first look at a potential contraband storage unit. Ooh -wee. Last slides on internals is just a few great shots of the cockpit and the level of detail that went into making theme fitting interfaces is great. Surprisingly, there's a good deal of activity you can see on them when you're in combat. For example, during targeting, you'll have corresponding lights activate, which is a nice touch. Moving on to crew members as they pertain to ships, there's actually not too much to cover. I've already covered the basics on crew members and companions in Entry 0.3 on Outpost, which you'll want to check out if you want to see how they function. I'll just gloss over the basics here. Crew members can be found in your travels or hired at spaceports. Recent confirmation from the Bethesda Q&A revealed that hiring crew members is a one-time fee and you've got them locked in for life once you've paid them. I sure hope you feed them well because they aren't making a credit more off you. Companions like the Constellation members can have up to four skills, and we've only seen up to three on standard crew members. There are robots as well, but it's not clear if they're capable enough to be part of your ship crew, as many are dinky little robots that are almost less functional than the Rick and Morty Butterbot. For robots like Bosco, however, that have working appendages, I could see them being an eligible crew member. Depending on the skills your crew members possess, they can provide direct benefits to your ship, such as starship engineering, any weapon system perks, piloting, and payloads, which you can see from the crew roster chart here. Skills that are active light up to indicate they're being utilized properly, while some are just flavor skills to help craft a narrative around the character and may never actually be used. Skills from crew members can stack with your skills, but it's not clear to what degree, as in can your level 3 astrodynamics and level 4 from Sarah Morgan combine to a theoretical 7, or is it up to the cap of 4 always? Companions also can't level up their skills, you get what you get. It's also not clear whether there's a finite number of crew you can find at these spaceports and they eventually dry up, or you can keep coming back for more and roll the dice for that perfect person to round out your crew. We've seen text in the ship builder for crew stations and crew capacity, but we just don't have enough in-game proof to definitively say exactly how it'll work and how much of an impact it will have when a fully stacked crew is on board with you. Will there be actual implications to assigning a crew member to a specific part of your ship? 
or is it more to just give you the freedom to have your crew be where you specifically want them? We're gonna have to wait until release to say anything with more confidence on this one. It'd be pretty funny if we could plant our contraband on our crew members though and get things past the contraband checks, but it might end up just getting them thrown in prison instead. Our final topic to cover today is on space travel itself. The Helium-3 powered grav drives in our ship are what make faster than light interstellar travel possible in Starfield. We know from the shipbuilder description that it's called the Graviton Loop Array, I believe Todd calls it the Graviton Loop Field Array, and the concept is very similar to Warp Drive from Star Trek and the real-life speculative concept of the Alcubierre Drive created by Miguel Alcubierre in 1994. In theory, it's possible, but we're nowhere near close to making this a reality yet. I'm not qualified to get into the nitty gritty of how this tech would work, but the general concept of how faster than light speed is achieved is by contracting the space in front of us while expanding the space behind us. By doing so, we're not actually moving through space faster than light, which is not possible. We're instead just shortening the distance between ourselves at point A and our target at point B. We're going to just have to assume that the humans of the Starfield universe have cracked this complex code and have a good explanation for how it's possible. I'm really hoping for some books or log entries in some labs that dig into this more deeply. Now that we have a general understanding of how this is possible, we can look at our grav drives in action on the star map example from the Direct. The map is actually 3D, so the relative distance from stars is a bit hard to put into perspective without seeing the rotation on the map. The first jump from Parima to Vali is a standard example of a jump that's possible to one shot. It's only 15 light years away and we have a drive capable of 20 light year jumps. Easy. However, if we try to reach the Linnaeus system, we see that it's simply not possible due to fuel constraints. It's cool that it auto charts the optimal path to the system based on your current ship capabilities. You'll notice that most of the systems in this example are actually red, meaning that your ship just simply doesn't have the capability of reaching there, while the other ones that you can are marked in white. I would expect that if we had a ship with a 35 light year grav drive, that I could cut a number of those jumps in the previous example from four to maybe even two. It's interesting that there's an orange number under cargo hold and that cargo is prominently featured in the travel data. I'm wondering if you pass a certain weight threshold, if that orange number will increase and represent an additional contribution to fuel consumption for jumping. Finally, we chart a course for Alpha Centauri and fire up the grav drive. It's neat to see the display information when you activate it as most of the text feels more or less realistic to what you'd want to be doing when plotting a course across the stars, calculating event trajectories, periapsis and apoapsis for orbits of celestial bodies within a system. It's a nice touch. And now you've made it. You get a nice little display on the HUD of all the celestial bodies within the system, with the blue triangle indicating the planet you're in proximity of. We see that this is a patrolled planet, so we've got to prepare to be scanned for contraband. I'm realizing now that if the scan just happens externally and no one's physically boarding our ship, then maybe our secret compartments could just be constructed in such a way that it disguises whatever is actually contained within them during the scan. It's kind of cool that you can see a bunch of ships just floating around the planet as well, hopefully most of which we can interact with. With regards to a landing spot, we have the option to quick land at any points of interest we've already discovered, or we can set a landing spot at almost any solid ground on the rest of the planet to freely explore. If you prefer to set a course for something else in the system you're currently in, you can also set a course for that, but it isn't clear whether you have to grav drive there or your regular engines can also do that job, and whether you can take the more scenic route and manually fly from one planet to another. Realistically, the distance between celestial bodies is going to be massive, so it doesn't make much sense to do that with just the engines, but it'd be cool to do a little rip from Earth to Mars to do some elongated muskrat role-playing. If it was going to be possible at all though, it would probably only be between a single planet and its accompanying moons. And that covers just about everything we know on space and space travel itself so far. I'll make sure to cover more on the actual planet and system surveys in a future entry on mechanics and game systems. Thank you for tuning in as always. Make sure to hit some buttons to engage with the video if you enjoyed and to keep yourself updated if you want more no BS Starfield content. Oh, and I have a Patreon now where you can get access to some cool perks. I'll be adding more to it over the next little while to enhance the experience, so check it out if it's of any interest to you. That's all for today. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.